Hi, uh, welcome to Astro Journey UK. In today's video, I'm going to be uh, doing a, an in-depth review of the ASI 183MC Pro uh, one-shot colour camera uh, that I've got mounted on my RedCap 51 telescope. I've had it for about a year now, and I figured it was um, a, a suitable time to do a review based on my experiences of imaging over the past year. I'm going to be going into um, some information about uh, the camera itself, the technical details of the camera, the plus points of uh, imaging with this particular camera, uh, the drawbacks and negative side of um, imaging with this camera, as well as uh, I'll sort of provide some tips about uh, making sure that you know what to do when uh, purchasing a telescope and making sure that the telescope and the camera are correctly matched from a sampling perspective. So if you'd like to hear more, then uh, keep watching. So uh, this camera is made by an organisation called ZWO, uh, currently retails in the UK for about £930, about $800 in the US and about €1,100 Euros in Europe. Interestingly, I mean, I, I bought this camera a year ago and it cost me about £740, so it's interesting how much it's gone up in that year. There are four variants of this, um, this camera. Um, so this is the one-shot colour uh, variant. Um, so you'll notice in the model numbers, they'll be called um, 183 MM, MC, and then there'll be a Pro attached to the end of it. Uh, the MM stands for monochrome. Uh, MC is uh, the color variant, uh, so one shot color. And the Pro um, is denotes whether or not um, it's got the cooling capability at the back of the camera. Um, and also you've got features like the USB hub, USB 3 uh, input there, both of or all of the variants have USB inputs and also you've got a power connector into the camera here uh, to be able to power the cooling. Uh, one thing that's great with um, the, the Pro variant with the uh, USB hub built into it means that when you've got it attached to your scope you can actually uh, connect other devices to the camera as well. Uh, so you can do things like uh, connecting a guide camera, uh, electronic focuser or something like that and you've got less cables going um, from the scope itself to uh, your device for, from an imaging perspective. Uh, less cable dangling uh, basically means less things and less chances to uh, get caught when doing things like slewing and meridian flips. So I'll quickly just run through the, uh, the, the technical aspects of this camera. Um, so starting off with the sensor, it's a, a one inch sensor uh, made by Sony. So it's a CMOS uh, sensor, the IMX183 uh, CQJJ. I'm um, sure those things mean something to someone. Its diagonal is 15.9 millimeters, um, which means that you can use this uh, with 1.25 inch filters. Uh, so those filters will be cheaper than um, say the two inch um, or the 36 millimeter filters. Uh, it has a resolution of uh, 20 megapixels. The, the pixel ratio is uh, 5,496 pixels by 3,672. Uh, the pixel size is uh, 2.4 micrometers um, and it's the pixel size which is uh, particularly important to me, um, certainly from a red cat uh, telescope perspective, it being at 240 millimeters and we'll get into that at a later point. Uh, standard Bayer pattern of uh, RGGB um, and uses a rolling shutter. The exposure range goes from 32 microseconds to 2000 seconds. Um, so when you're thinking about doing things like lucky imaging and you're focusing on frames per second, then uh, obviously that range there helps uh, quite a deal. Ports ROI or region of interest. Uh, so when you're doing, say, planetary imaging, uh, you're able to select a part of the uh, sensor to be able to capture, and that will allow you to increase the frame rate as well. Um, from a quantum efficiency perspective, uh, it's 84% uh, efficient. Well, it's basically a very good uh, efficiency rating. If you compare this to the uh, 1600mm uh, Pro camera that I've got, which is a, a very well-respected camera, uh, the quantum efficiency of that camera is actually 60%, so it's a massive improvement there. So the uh, full well for this particular sensor is uh, 15,000 electrons. If you think about full well as being um, a bucket, so each pixel has its own bucket, and 
the full well is the amount of uh, photons or electrons that can be uh, contained or stored by that bucket. So um, you will get 15,000 uh, electrons in that bucket before it becomes completely full and saturated. Um, and that's actually quite a, a good value for uh, Astro cameras. From an analog to digital converter perspective, uh, this camera actually operates at 12 uh, bits. Uh, those 12 bits basically means that you get 4,096 uh, individual shades of brightness. Uh, so if you think of um, going from black to white, you've got 4,096 shades of that. When you uh, multiply that up uh, in terms of an RGB image, that equates to about 16.7 million colours. Um, that does sound actually quite impressive, but actually if you look at some of the, uh, the bigger cameras, or the, the higher end cameras like the 2600, uh, for example, that's a 14 bit camera and it then hits the um, basically the trillions of colors. And the, the cooling aspect of this camera, um, it's able to actually cool down to minus 40 degrees to 45 degrees of the ambient temperature. So for example, if it's 20 degrees out in, in summer, which um, is about as good as it gets in the UK, um, then you can actually cool the camera down to minus 20. Uh, so it's, it's important to know that. And the cooling aspect is a very important uh, point from a pro camera perspective. If you can uh, cool your camera, you can specify what temperature to actually cool it down to. It then means that you've got the benefits of uh, taking one set of bias frames, one set of darks, um, put those in your library, and you just use those same calibration frames for every image that you um, image at that particular temperature. So compare that to say a digital SLR or a, a camera that isn't uh, possible to cool it, you would have to take those calibration frames every time you image. In terms of uh, other capabilities of this camera, so um, it's suitable from a, a, a planetary perspective, a lunar, a solar, and also deep sky objects. Um, but particularly from the planetary side, um, whenever you're doing things like planetary imaging or lunar and solar, um, as well as lucky imaging as well, uh, you're going to be interested in terms of frames per second, how many images you can capture um, and get the data for of that particular target um, within a certain number of seconds. So with uh, this particular camera, uh, the default or the lowest frame rate is actually 19 frames per second, which is pretty good for a 20 megapixel image. Um, and you can download all of that data through that fast USB 3 connector. Um, however, if uh, you wanted to get a higher frame rate, then you can use the region of interest um, capability in the camera uh, to sort of shrink that down. And you can also uh, get up to um, 308 frames per second if you dropped it down to a 10-bit uh, analog to digital uh, conversion, um, which uh, people don't really recommend. However, uh, still at the 12 uh, bit level, you can get 271 frames per second at a resolution of 320 by 240. Um, to be honest, and I will be honest with you, I've never done planetary um, imaging because my telescopes aren't, uh, don't have enough reach. Um, so therefore I can't comment on, on how useful that particular aspect is. One of the points to make about the sensor that's used in the 183 camera is it's not a backlit sensor. And what that essentially means is it will uh, suffer with a, a phenomenon, if that's the right word, uh, called amp glow. And we'll get into that in a little bit. So on to uh, why I bought this particular camera. Uh, the main reason was uh, about a year ago, I went out and bought a William Optics Red Cat 51 telescope. And uh, I cannot say a bad thing about this telescope. It's absolutely fantastic, perfect for a beginner. Uh, it's a 250 millimeter refractor telescope. Um, just everything about it, the build quality, the image quality is just, just brilliant. However, the problem that I had with um, this particular scope, because it was at 250 millimeters and the existing cameras that I had, uh, so I have the ASI 1600mm uh, Pro camera, and also I have the ASI 533MC Pro camera. Both of those cameras, due to the pixel size in those cameras, would result in my images being un, uh, undersampled. So 
So uh, undersampling basically means that your pixels are too big for the focal length of the camera. And what that means is you don't have um, enough pixels to, to create a defined uh, star shape, for example. So you'll result in having sort of large pixelated uh, blocky stars. Although that sounds quite bad, actually, uh, from speaking to other people in reality, um, you have to zoom in quite far to be able to see some of these artifacts. So it does come down to how much you're actually bothered about it. Um, but at the point uh, that I was buying the scope, I, I sort of thought that this was something I actually would be bothered about. At the opposite to undersampling is, uh, no surprises, oversampling. And this is where your pixels are actually uh, too small for the uh, focal length that you've got. And what that ends up meaning is um, when you're imaging in stars, they will sort of spread out over uh, many pixels and then you'll end up with a, um, a sort of a fuzzier, bloated um, stars in your image, which um, you, you wouldn't necessarily want as well. Um, there are many tools available online uh, to be able to sort of do these calculations and see whether your uh, telescope and your camera actually work with each other. Uh, there's one on Bintel, um, which I'm showing you right now. Um, but also you can do the same calculation yourself. Um, it's essentially um, the pixel size divided by the focal length, multiply it by 206.3. Uh, don't ask me why uh, that particular value. And that gives you the arc seconds per pixel. And you, you want something within the range of um, about sort of 0.67 to 2 arc seconds. Um, this is also factored in in terms of your seeing as well. So it's not literally that's the figure that I need to aim for. Um, you need to factor in uh, what your seeing conditions are for the night that you're imaging. Um, but I think at the end of the day, this is a, a good sort of general place to be. Uh, so what's what's good about this camera? Um, well. It's a, a ZWO uh, camera, which uh, works really well with my um, imaging setup and rig. Um, obviously quite matched uh, perfectly to the uh, red cat that's in the background there. Um, but also I use the ASI Air devices uh, for all of my imaging planning and um, capture and all of those sorts of things. And being a ZWO product, naturally it's gonna work very well with that. Um, being the pro version, um, also very good because um, of the cooling capability. Uh, the hub in the back to be able to connect to other other devices on my rig and reduce the number of uh, cables that are, are looping around all over the place. Um, and generally, the the image quality is um, is is pretty good as well. I've been very very pleased with all of the images that I've uh, captured using this camera and the William Optics telescope. Uh, one thing that's, that's kind of a plus point, but uh, it depends on your um, frame of mind or your, your perceptions, etc., is, is the fact that it's a one-shot colour camera. Um, the reason why I got this over a mono, I, I could have used the monochrome and I could have taken the filter wheel and everything, um, but what I really wanted was a nice compact rig um, that I could keep this attached to the, um, the Red Cat 51 and uh, just drop in uh, particular filters if I needed to. Uh, so a lot of the time I'm either doing sort of broadband, like full RGB um, imaging using the Optolong uh, L-Pro filter, um, which is just a light pollution filter, uh, but also I use it uh, in conjunction with the L-Extreme filter, and I find um, all of those combinations work um, super, super well. Partly why I've also got a, a one-shot colour camera was um, we don't really get that many clear nights in uh, in the UK, so um, it, it sort of works in terms of um, being able to get a, a pretty good respectable image just in one night, uh, not having to take multiple filters um, and the increased integration time required there. So on to uh, the negative points of this camera. Uh, to be honest, I've only got two, um, two issues with this camera, which is, which is good because I don't generally do pretty much like this, um, this camera. Uh, the first point um, you'll notice uh, with this camera, I've got this heating element around here. Um, so an issue that I had with this camera um, was uh, one evening taking some images. Um, everything else has got like dew straps and dew heaters on to make sure the elements of the um, telescope and the guide scopes don't uh, fog up. But I had 
never come across the problem whereby the glass in front of the camera actually dews up as well. The, the, the ASI Air device, when it's cooling down the sensor, does sort of cool it down very slowly to try and avoid this, um, but that seemed to be not uh, sufficient in this case. So I had to uh, go out and purchase a he heating element, um, fit it onto the camera, um, and that's removed the problem. Um, it's just a bit of a shame that they don't put these on or provide them um, when you actually buy them because there's nothing more annoying than when you're actually out imaging and you go, oh great, I can't fix this because you can't get to it. It's not the sort of thing that you can uh, rectify in the field. So that's uh, problem number one. Problem number two, and this is an annoying one, and that is the amp glow that you get from the sensor itself. So I mentioned before that this isn't a backlit sensor. Um, all backlit sensors uh, don't have issues with amp glow and you don't need um, uh, darks, uh, dark calibration frames, which is fantastic. Um, but this one you definitely do. Um, and you absolutely need them uh, for this image that I'm showing you now, which is a uh, dark calibration file and you can see the amp glow literally bursting across the entirety of the image. Calibration frames, um, do calibrate these out um, so you can remove most of the impact of that however i've i have found that um, that doesn't always work or it might sort of affect the final image a bit as well um, so i think that's just one thing to uh, be mindful of this particular camera is is the amp glow uh, calibration should help but doesn't always completely help but um i'm going to finish this video by sharing uh, images that I've taken with this camera and images that I'm very very pleased with and you'll be able to see um, for yourself whether you think that this is a particular problem or not. So um, I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, if you would like to uh, yeah, make any comments in terms of your uh, experiences or feelings with this camera um, or also just actually comment on the images that you see at the end and say whether or not you think that um, it's a, uh, the amp glow issue is a problem or not. Um, it would be great to hear from you. So I'm uh, going to leave it at that. Uh, take a look at the images at the end and uh, thank you very much for watching.